Please take your Bibles and turn with me to Hebrews chapter 13, and I'll be reading the first 14 verses. Let love of the brethren continue. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. Remember the prisoners as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated since you yourselves are also in the body. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Make sure that your character is free from the love of money, being content with what you have, for he himself has said, I will never desert you, nor will I ever forsake you, so that we confidently say, The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, though through which those who were so occupied were not benefited. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat for the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people through his own blood, suffered outside the gate. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we do not have a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. We come now to the final chapter of this great epistle the, in the general epistles of the New Testament. And it is with a certain sadness that we come to the final chapter, at least in my own heart, we have been making our way through this very challenging year in Hebrews and taking our time patiently working our way through the incredible riches that are here. But we come to the final three sermons that we take out of this single chapter. And we are considering how that we are seeking for a city, not the city in which we dwell. We are seeking another city. And the key verse which I wish to highlight to you is the final one I read, verse 14. Here we do not have a lasting city. Cities have come and cities have gone. Perhaps the city in which you dwell is the city in which you were born. Perhaps the city in which you were born is hundreds or even thousands of miles away. But we do not speak of the cities of this world. We are speaking rather of the city to which we go, the city which we shall dwell in for all eternity. That is our focus. And what is held out to us here in the first half of Hebrews chapter 13 is what is the character of the people who will dwell in that kind of city, that city to which we go. I take you back to Hebrews chapter 11, you will recall that we made our way very, very quickly through that great chapter in just one sermon, and there was much that we could have examined, but we are saving that, and we are going to savor it at another point. But here also in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 13 and following, I read, All these died in faith. There was Enoch, and there was Noah, and there were others 
who had walked with God, who had trusted God, who had lived their lives by faith, but they had not received all that God had for them. They had known his blessings, but there was much more. And in verse 13, it reads, All these they died in faith. They took their last breath, but that last breath was also taken, trusting in God. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them, they were confident of them, having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance, having confessed there was something that was in their heart and upon their lips, having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. That is what the believer in Christ is. This is not our eternal dwelling. We are moving forward, ever progressing towards that celestial city where we shall dwell for all eternity. Our dwelling here in this world is that we are not of this world, but we are of that world to come. We are in this world we are a part of it for a short time, but we go to that place where Christ is preparing an eternal home for us. Having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Verse 14, For those who say such things, they talk in this manner, for those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. Canada, I am a citizen of Canada, and I am proud to be a citizen of Canada. But I look for that city, and I look for that country where I will dwell for all eternity. Here I dwell for a few decades, but I look for that place where I will dwell for all eternity in the very presence of God. Looking, they're seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had opportunity to return. It's so natural that we be pulled and drawn back to that which we know it has a, a grip upon us. But when we set our affections and set our desires, our full heart, upon that place where we go, those other things fall aside. Verse 16, but as it is, they desire a better country. In Hebrews, we've been talking about a better Savior who offered a better sacrifice because he was working on the principles of a better covenant. And we have a better tabernacle. We have everything that is better in Christ Jesus. Here also, we read, they desire a better country, that is a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, that dwelling, that city where I am, that you might also be with me for all eternity. That is Hebrews chapter 11. There in the mid, starting with verse 13. But come back now with me to Hebrews chapter 13. And here, we do not have this lasting city, but our whole focus, our entire being is set upon that city, which is to come. Now with that as the point at which we are driving towards, not only in our being, not only in our confidence in Christ, not only in, in this sermon, but here, our, the, the previous verses, starting with verse 1, they are all pointing to this statement. And this is the 
rationale, this is the raison d'etre that is given to us for what comes before. At verse 1 says, let love of the brethren continue. Well, why should we let love of the brethren continue? There are very good reasons for it, but it is because we go and we are moving towards that city. And in that place, there is no hate, there is no despising one another. We are seeking that city and part of the character of those who will dwell there and part of the character of those who are sojourning and moving forward is that love of the brethren should continue. Now, it says, let love of the brethren continue. It's basically saying, don't put any roadblock or any hindrance before love continuing. Among family members, it's just natural, it just happens that love is shared. And so here it's saying, don't try to crank it up, don't try to manufacture it, just let it happen. You are brothers and sisters in the family of God. You are children of the eternal God. And so just let that love which you have received, let that flow into the lives of those round about you. Let it happen. Let love of the brethren continue. Secondly, verse 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. For by this some have entertained angels without knowing it. This is a fascinating verse. And I've spoken with some people who have really wondered, and, and, and I've had an experience like this myself, I really wondered whether that person, that man, who took Charlene under his wing, as it were, he didn't have wings, but he took us and he showed us kindness when we, as a young married couple, very far from home, thousands of miles from home, in a foreign culture, and desperately needing some help, he looked after us. He had never known us before. I have never seen him since. I wondered whether he was not an angel who God had sent to us in our hour of need. Fascinating to think that we have encountered angels but been completely unaware of it. Here it says, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers. And why is that? God has shown such an open-handedness with us. The very character of our God is that he is generous, that he is lavish with his bounty toward us. He would have that we also, in like manner, be open-handed and generous with others. And not just within the family of God, but that is important, of course, but even to those who we have never met before, entertaining strangers. For by this, some have entertained angels, and they didn't even have any clue about it. Number three, verse three. Remember the prisoners, as though in prison with them, and those who are ill-treated, since you yourself also are in the body. In the first century Christian world, there were all kinds of people. We think of Paul, we think of Peter, we think of Silas, we think of so many of those earliest Christian leaders. Prison was perfectly well known to them. They knew what it was to suffer in the body because of proclaiming Christ. And all of the disciples of Jesus met a martyr's death because of their proclamation of Jesus Christ. It's just right that here it is said a word about prisoners that we should remember them as though we were right there alongside of them. Verse 4 and onward talks about marriage. And remember that as we go to this city which God has prepared for us, we are 
loving the brethren, showing kindness even to strangers. Prisoners, though we aren't in prison, we treat them as though we are also suffering with them. Now, verse 4, the fourth point, marriage. Marriage among those who are traveling to that celestial city is to be held in very great honor by each and every one. Marriage is to be held in honor among all, and the marriage bed is to be undefiled, for there is very good reason fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. God will settle accounts one day among those who have abused and those who have scorned the sanctity of marriage. Verse 5. Make sure your character is free from the love of money. Those who are traveling, those who are seeking this city, they are not concerned about grabbing all that they can in this world, for they realize that to load up on the things of this world will only weigh them down. It will only break their pace. It will only drag them. And so the counsel here is, verse 5, make absolutely sure that your character is not one who is trying to grab it all and hold on to it all, but make sure that your character is not one who is loving, loving money. He says, being content with what you have because you are confident of this, that he himself has made a declaration, I will never desert you, I will never ever forsake you. God himself has made promises to us and based upon his perfect record of keeping his word, every word we receive with rock-solid confidence that what God has said, he will in fact do. We don't need to be lovers of money, for we have something infinitely better. We have God himself who is watching over us. The person who loves money, they are insecure in their future, they're thinking, I need to grab a hold of all that I can in order to make sure that I don't run out. But the believer in Christ knows that what we have is just temporary in this world. But when we have the Lord Jesus Christ as the one who watches over us, when he is our good and great shepherd, we need not fear and we need not be lying awake at night and wondering, will we make it? Verse 6 says, we may confidently say, we have heard what God has said, that I will never desert you, I will, won't ever forsake you. That is God's word to us. Now we reciprocate back and we have something that we can say, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? Having heard God's word, it stirs within our hearts words of confidence and we are able to move forward. The Lord is my helper. It's like Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? Verse 7. Remember those who led you, who spoke the word of God to you, and considering the result of their conduct, imitate their faith. The Apostle Paul was the one who said, follow me as I follow Christ. Here is a very similar word, that we are to imitate the faith of those who have spoken the word to us and considering, we 
evaluate. We, we don't just grab a hold of any and everyone. There is to be wisdom that is used, but we are to evaluate, we are to consider the result of their conduct and in so doing, imitate their faith. I've been told that imitation is the highest form of praise. Well, here we are to imitate their faith as a means of commending the road which they have walked, also walking in it. Remember those who led you. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. I'm sure that you have heard this and undoubtedly memorized it, for it is so easily remembered. And perhaps you've sung the great song, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. This takes us into the deep theology of the very person of God, that he is immutable. We are so mutable, but God himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is immutable. He does not change. And here it is plainly said that Jesus Christ, he is the same yesterday, as far back as you want to go. He is the same today, and he is the same and shall be the same tomorrow and forever. Jesus Christ the same. He is the same one who has loved you. He is the same one who has died for you. He is the same one whose blood will never lose its power. And you can come to him and you can call upon his great name. Verse 9 says, Do not be carried away by varied and strange teaching. Has it ever occurred to you that in the New Testament, there were already in the first century warnings, stern warnings, about not being carried away by strange teachings. And here it's told us it is good for the heart not to be, uh, to be strengthened by grace, not by foods. There were those who had many rules within the early Christian church. Look, you can't eat that, and you've got to uh, watch the calendar, making sure that you're keeping all of the Mosaic laws. And here we read, be careful, be ever so very careful that you are not carried away by these strange teachings. And we are told, verse 11, we have an altar the comparison is again made between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. There was a great altar in the Old Temple where sacrifice was brought. And certain sacrifices which were made, the worshiper would then partake along with the priests in the eating of a portion of the sacrifice. Here we are told that we have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. We come and we are a part of Jesus Christ and we partake in the communion service remembering the body and the blood of Jesus Christ and we give thanks for all that he has done for us. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy place by the high priest as an offering for sin are burned outside the camp. And we are told Jesus also, he suffered outside the gate of Jerusalem. He was taken out that he might be crucified. And we are told now, because Christ in humility has gone out amid the mocking and the scorn, he has gone out, we should also go out to him. At the beginning of chapter 12, we were told that we are to fix our eyes upon Jesus. Our whole being is to be enraptured 
and wrapped in him. Here we are told once again that though others might scorn, we are to go out to our Savior and we are to delight in him and in him alone. So go out to the Lord Jesus Christ and there delight yourself in him, bearing even his reproach. Many of these Hebrews, they were concerned that they would be reproached, that they would fall under condemnation. But we go out following him who bore our reproach. And now, now though it is not a heavy load, we bear his, even the mocking that this world has for us. We go out to him who died on, in our behalf. Here we do not have a lasting city, but we continue to look for that which is to come. Through this pandemic and through the difficulties that we pass right now, our eyes continue to be set upon Jesus Christ and his surpassing beauty. I would want you to lift your eyes off of whatever the difficulty is that you are facing, whether it be, in fact, the pandemic and the isolation and the difficulties which we face. I would want you to lift your eyes and set them upon Jesus Christ. And I would want you to set them upon that city to which we go and that country where we shall dwell for all eternity. Beautiful, beautiful place. Why don't you come before the Lord and just surrender yourself to him? Oh, how he has loved you. He has borne your reproach. He has borne your shame and your guilt. He took upon his sinless soul the sin of us all. Is it so much that we bear reproach for his sake? Lord, I pray that your hand would be upon each one who hears right now and that they would realize that here is treasure indeed. Here is blessing indeed. And may they not shirk, may they not draw back, but may they rejoice in all of your constant and overflowing goodness. These mercies we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.